You know that feeling when your phone or your laptop is just snappy, where everything just works instantly? Well, that speed isn't just about the main processor. There's this invisible hero working behind the scenes, a component so absolutely critical that without it, our entire digital world would just grind to a halt. Today, we're going to pull back the curtain on this unsung hero, the data cache. So let's just start with a puzzle. We have these CPUs that are, you know, ridiculously powerful, capable of billions of operations every single second. So why do we still see loading wheels? Why isn't everything just instant? Well, the answer lies in this fundamental traffic jam that's happening deep inside your machine. And this right here shows you the crazy scale of that traffic jam. Just look at this. A single CPU operation, that tiny little bar on the left, takes one clock cycle. Okay. But to go get data from main memory, that monster bar next to it, the CPU has to sit there and wait for over 200 cycles. That's like a world-class sprinter having to stop for three full minutes every single time they need a sip of water. It's a huge, huge bottleneck. This massive speed gap actually has a name, and honestly, it sounds as dramatic as it really is. Computer architects call it the Great Memory Wall, and for decades, it's been the number one villain in the whole story of high-performance computing. So here's the core of the problem. Over the years, CPUs got exponentially faster, you know, thanks to Moore's law, but the speed of RAM, it, it barely budged in comparison. So that created this massive, ever-widening gap, forcing our lightning-fast processors to just sit on their hands, constantly waiting for slow memory to deliver the data they need to do their job. So how do you solve an impossible problem like the memory wall? Well, it turns out you don't break through it, you build a really clever shortcut around it. And that shortcut is the data cache, a small, incredibly fast little pocket of memory that sits right next to the processor, kind of like its own personal assistant. The genius of the cache is that it exploits two really simple truths about how computer programs actually work. First is what we call temporal locality. If you just used a piece of data, the odds are you're going to need it again very, very soon. And second, spatial locality. If you just use data from one spot, you're probably about to need the data that's stored right next to it. The cache uses these principles to make really good guesses about what the CPU needs next. So how's this whole shortcut organized? Honestly, the best way to think about it is like a chef's kitchen. It's laid out perfectly here. The L1 cache, that's the tiny set of ingredients you have right on your countertop. Super fast to grab, but there's not much space. The L2 is your kitchen pantry. A little slower to get to, but it holds a lot more. The L3 is like a bigger shared pantry for all the chefs in the kitchen. And main memory, or RAM, that's the grocery store down the street. Sure, you can get anything you want, but the trip takes a long time. Now, when the cash has to go all the way to that grocery store, it doesn't just bring back one single carrot. No, it brings back a whole bag of groceries. This is called a cash line, a 64-byte chunk of data. This takes advantage of that spatial locality principle we just talked about, betting that if you needed that one carrot, you're probably going to need the celery and onions that were right next to it on the shelf. But, you know, even the most brilliant shortcut isn't perfect. Sometimes, the cash guess is wrong. The data the CPU needs isn't on the countertop, and it's not in the pantry. This failure has a name. It's called a cash miss, and it forces the CPU to make that long, slow, painful trip all the way to main memory. And there are three main reasons for a mess, what people often call the three C's. A compulsory miss is just unavoidable. It's the very first time you ever ask for an ingredient. You have to go get it. A capacity miss happens when your countertop is simply too small to hold all the ingredients you need at once. And a conflict miss, this one's a bit like a design flaw in your kitchen, where the only spot for onions is also the only spot for carrots, so you're constantly having to swap them out. Okay, so reading data is one thing, but what happens when the CPU needs to write new information? This introduces a really big trade-off. You've got the write-through method, which is super cautious. It updates both the cache and main memory at the exact same time. It's safe, but it's slow. Then you've got write-back, which is the speed demon. It only updates the cache for now and just waits to update memory until it absolutely has to. It's way faster, but it adds a whole lot of complexity to the system. As if that wasn't complicated enough, modern computers make it even trickier. Your computer doesn't have just one chef anymore. It's got multiple cores, and each of those cores has its own private L1 and L2 caches. This creates a brand new problem. How do you keep all the chefs working from the same, up-to-date recipe book? This is what we call the cache coherence problem. I mean, think about it. If one chef changes an ingredient amount in their private little cache, how do all the other chefs find out about that change? 
If they don't, you could have one chef using a cup of sugar while another is still using the old recipe that called for two. The result would just be complete chaos. So to prevent that kitchen chaos, all multi-core systems have to follow two really strict rules. First, right propagation, any change made by one core has to, eventually, be seen by all the others. And second, right serialization, if two cores change the same piece of data, everybody in the system has to agree on the exact order that those changes happened. All right, now for a really fascinating twist. The cache, our hero of speed and efficiency, actually has a dark side. The very thing that makes it so fast, its ability to know whether data is close by or far away, can be turned against it to leak some of your most sensitive information. Here's how it works. An attacker can cleverly measure exactly how long it takes for a program to access a certain piece of memory. If the access is super fast, they know that data was just used and it's sitting right there in the cache. If it's slow, they know it wasn't. By doing this over and over, they can slowly piece together secret information, like your encryption keys, just based on the little ghostly footprints left behind in the cache. And this is not just some academic theory. These timing attacks are the real deal. They're the basis for some of the most infamous security bugs in history. Attacks like Spectre and Meltdown use these exact principles to break the most fundamental security barriers inside our processors, proving that these cache side channels are a very real and very serious threat. So all of this brings us to the future. I mean, after 50 years, where does this incredibly clever yet sometimes vulnerable idea go from here? The challenges are bigger than ever. And believe me, engineers are coming up with some truly radical new ideas. Okay, first up, what if the cache didn't get amnesia every time you shut down your computer? Non-volatile caches, using new kinds of memory, could hold on to data permanently. This would mean your computer could wake up instantly with all your most used data already sitting there, waiting in the fastest possible spot. Now here's an even wilder idea. It's called near data processing. For decades, we spent a ton of energy just hauling data from memory over to the processor. This new model just flips that whole thing on its head. It says, let's put tiny little processors right inside the memory itself. This could basically eliminate most of that data movement, which is the single biggest energy cost in our systems today. And of course, you knew AI was going to get involved. Researchers are now using machine learning to build way smarter caches. So instead of relying on simple, hard-coded rules, these new caches can actually learn your specific program's behavior and then make incredibly accurate predictions about what data you'll need next, pushing efficiency even further than we thought possible. At the end of the day, this quote really captures the magic of the whole thing. The data cache is just a masterpiece of practical engineering. It solves the seemingly impossible physics problem with a clever illusion, giving us the experience of this huge, lightning-fast memory system that doesn't technically exist. It's a beautiful, complicated, and absolutely essential piece of technology. But as our computing needs get more and more complex with AI and these massive data sets, the question becomes, will this 50-year-old idea continue to be our clever shortcut, or is it destined to become the foundation for the next great memory wall?